Welcome to Make Your Money Matter with Brad Barrett, the show that aims to change the way you think about wealth management. Brad is a certified financial advisor, established radio host, and author of Retire Right. He is a managing director and partner at One Capital Management, an SEC-registered investment advisory firm managing over $4 billion for clients across the nation. Brad and his team are dedicated to helping clients protect and preserve their assets so they can reach their investment and retirement goals. And now, your host of Make Your Money Matter, Brad Barrett. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to Make Your Money Matter. I'm your host, Brad Barrett. I'm also a managing director and partner here at One Capital Management. And I'm here each and every week to help you develop a better relationship with your money because after all, your money matters. And today, I'm gonna be talking about inflation and baby formula. Now, might seem like a strange subtopic there, but right now, as the show is being filmed, they're oddly connected, and I'll get into that later. But inflation is the topic right now, isn't it? No matter where you go or, or where you get your information around this topic, the issue of inflation is on all of our minds. It's on the news every day. Folks are discussing it around the water cooler. We really can't get away from it. And it's front and center with things like food and gas prices and everything that's going on in our economy right now. But before we dive into inflation and baby formula, which I'll bring up here, take a deep breath and let's go into inflation and let's get into it. So everyone's been talking about it and we're all thinking it. And even though it's a serious topic to all of us, I figured I'd try to lighten the mood here and do a little comparison as I often try to do with the use of an analogy. Does anyone remember deflate gate? Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about or not a sports fan at all, it was the National Football League's allegation that at the time, New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady ordered the deliberate deflation of footballs that were used in his victory against the Indianapolis Colts in the 2014 AFC Championship game. Now, quick aside, that game resulted in a 42-7 to win by the Patriots. I don't know about you, but you don't really have to know much about sports to know that a deflated or, fact of matter, an inflated ball is probably not going to have that kind of score, but I digress. Now, this whole thing resulted in a $1 million fine against the team. To be honest... Not so sure Robert Kraft was really that affected. And it ended up costing Tom Brady four games, plus two draft picks were taken away from the team in 2016. So that was Deflategate. So what I wanna talk about today, what I'm titling this week's show is Inflategate. Are the two connected? Absolutely not. I just like the name, so we're gonna go with it. But we're gonna talk about Inflategate and how it has impacted our supply chains and then into something that came up a few months ago around baby formula. Now. As you've likely seen in the past couple months, we've seen stories come out around the baby formula shortage. And here at One Capital Management, this actually kicked up a couple months ago when this news was coming out in one of our investment committees. And a lot of us were sitting around discussing what's going on in the economy, both macro and micro levels. And we kept going back to this question that I think a lot of our clients were thinking around supply chains. And I wanted to dig into this because it actually highlights some of the issues we've been talking about here on the Make Your Money Matter show as well as with our clients as it relates to supply chain, which ultimately is kicking up inflation and likely what we've seen in the volatility in the markets. The direness of the current US shortage really begged this question to us. What did we actually do before we had baby formula? In looking into history on this subject, which we did, there were many mothers that breastfed and still to this day do God's intention with this all, right? But mothers, in historical times, also died at childbirth at a much higher rate than they do now. And like my wife, many moms actually couldn't produce enough supply for their babies, or they had to go to work to make ends meet, so formula just wasn't as convenient. And many years ago, many weren't actually able to breastfeed the child, so some babies were unable to latch, some were adopted, there were different reasons for things. So there's different variations of the age-old question of what did we do before baby formula? And there's a reason why I'm going through this history here, because if we think about it, what was the solution then at the time when safe, nutritious formula didn't really exist? Some babies were actually nursed by other mothers, friends, or relatives in their communities, believe it or not. The wealthy at that time could retain a wet nurse. The riskiest alternative that we found in researching was actually to bottle or spoon feed babies homemade concoctions, usually including things like animal milk or grains or other things, and this is all in the days before refrigeration or antibiotics, and a whole host of vaccines, so it's not hard to see the dangers here. Now, when you look at history, 
It wasn't until 1846 that a guy named Justus von Liebig, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, a German chemist who created the first commercial formula, which appeared on US shelves in 1869. Now, the product's popularity at the time drew competition from Nestle's milk, and there was a whole host of others around this too. And over time, nutrition scientists worked to create formulas more closely matching human milk, and companies like Johnson & Johnson actually came in and joined the fray. The problem was this, and there's a whole reason I'm going into this here for today's topic. These products rarely met babies' nutritional needs. Carla Salasco is an infant feed historian. By the way, when I looked that up, if you're thinking that that does exist, it's true. And she was quoted in saying, before the advent of modern formula in the 1950s, a lot of babies died of illness or starvation because they couldn't breastfeed and alternative foods were not safe or adequate. Now, I wanna take a quick aside for a second. I've said this before on the show and I say this a lot on our radio programs and our podcasts and with clients, technology is a disruptor. I've said it multiple times before and if you ever wanna prove me wrong on that, try to look up Blockbuster on your Blackberry. It's just not gonna happen. So we can see that the human element to us here in the United States in particular and around the world, we have the desire and the need to grow and to advance our life and our world. And, and I think baby formula is a great example of that. And I think if you look at the current landscape right now, the US shortage has had a lot of parents, many clients I've spoken to, who with young children right now, babies in fact, scouring the internet often, and they're paying these exorbitant prices, driving hundreds of miles to reach stores and basically contacting regional milk banks, where, by the way, many donors in my research have become heroes in our research here at the firm. There's a lady named Judy Chung, who's a first time mother. She's already donated well over 2000 ounces to the New York Milk Bank. Now this is according to the New York Times in our article we're reading. So it's interesting. Most people have come to understand what Salasco wrote in Time Magazine, quote, modern infant formula is a life-saving marvel, not necessarily a luxury. So this is my question here for today, and this is going to lead us into the second half of our discussion today around inflation. My question is, how did a country like ours, the United States, get to a point where such a critical commodity, one that our babies rely on for health, becomes so scarce? And when we looked into this, the answer, believe it or not, is far more complicated than whatever political talking points you might be hearing. The problem actually began with the start of the pandemic, when parents begin to hoard formula in order to prepare for the worst. Remember the toilet paper spree? It was also happening for baby formula. So once parents had all these stockpiles and calmed the demand, it actually ebbed, the demand did, and manufacturers began producing less product. By the way, this is a good example of what we see in a functional economy. We're gonna see corporations adjusting and adapting to the times based on demand and supply. So when you're a company and you see demand going down or ebbing even a little bit, they're gonna naturally produce less product because we are in a just-in-time supply ever since the early 80s. So when the pandemic concerns and rules eased, manufacturers began ramping back up. In January of this year, 2022, about seven months ago, as you've likely heard about, an Abbott-owned formula plant shut down due to a bacterial contamination. Now, what was exasperated all this is that this company, Abbott, accounts for, get this, 43% of formula sales in the United States. It's not necessarily a monopoly, by the way, we looked into this. The industry could be considered an oligopoly though, because there's four companies, Abbott, Johnson Nutrition, Nestle USA, and Perigo. They make up 90% of the market share. So, not a monopoly, but definitely an oligopoly. So to make matters worse here, Abbott, according to Politico, is the sole contractor of formula in 49 states for the WIC program, which is the federal program that many low-income families rely on through vouchers to get formula. So in May of this year, a couple months ago, when President Biden launched the awkwardly phrased Operation Fly Formula, projected to basically import via commercial aircraft, actually the equivalent of 17 million ounce bottles by the end of June. Now, prior to that, however, little of this product had actually been imported. And I wanna bring this up. FDA guidelines, so say what you will, but FDA guidelines are very strict, more so than nearly all foreign food safety agencies. 
And there's trade agreements such as the USMCA, which is basically the revised NAFTA tariffs. And by the way, real quickly, when I say tariffs, I'm talking about 14.9% to 17.5% respectively on most favored nations imported formula and then 25% on the rest. Those are high tariffs. And then after that, the aforementioned WIC further discouraged foreign manufacturers from entering the US market. So under the best of economic climates, Abbott's shutdown would have been a big problem. The supply chain issues made it a full-blown crisis, which is why we all heard about it and the news sources picked it up, adding to the other well-known pandemic-related shortages, everything from vehicles to farming chemicals to a lot of other consumer staples, just to name a few. Pointing out again, that pandemic-related economic issues has actually, if you noticed, become a bit like listening to Leonard Skinner's Freebird. Just when you think there's no more, another guitar riff begins. Stay connected. Get frequent updates on the show. Follow Brad Barrett and Make Your Money Matter on most social media platforms. And catch full episodes of Make Your Money Matter streaming now on our YouTube channel. To schedule your no-obligation appointment, go to OneCapital.com or call 805-410-5454. Now, I want to bring up a couple more items here. The labor shortage and today's topic, rising inflation. You see my tie-in here? Inflation has come to the forefront given the price of gas, if you look at just that, which, by the way, has a far greater demand as a commodity, believe it or not, than baby formula. So in previous shows, I've touched on the ongoing conflict overseas, some of the things being done to rectify what's going on, and all the items that we've led to where we are right now with market volatility and very high inflation. Since then, as expected, the Federal Reserve embarked on, we'll call it an interest rate increase marathon. And these hikes have far-reaching implications in our country. I mean, just look at it right now. Mortgage rates are hovering around 6%, and they started, by the way, the beginning of this year at about 275 and there's been a lot of research on this. Fortune is one of them declaring the pandemic housing boom is over. And at the same time, the bond market and equity markets have had, as we've seen and we've talked about, sharp sell-offs uh, in this market with the volatility. So that's the question that keeps coming up. The, the news pundits love to throw out that word recession. So when we talk about inflation, we want to talk about recession. For a quick pause here for a second. Going back to our previous episodes around inflation and market volatility, inflation is very simply stated as this. It's too much money chasing too few of goods. And we define money by what's called M2. You've heard, likely heard about this, or if you're watching any sort of CNBC outlets, and I want to talk about this. Us economic nerds look at this M2. We look at it, by the way, because Milton Friedman told us to. <laughs> if you don't know who Milton Friedman is, he's sort of the father of economics, right? But M2 is basically this. It's all money in circulation. So it's in circulation being used. It also includes all deposits at all banks. So certificate deposits, money markets, savings. We have a money supply growth issue, which is what we will commonly refer to as printing money. So we commonly talked about it, but what we define it as, as an M2 money supply. So I want to bring up a stat here when we talk about inflation and the M2 money supply that's in circulation. From February of 2020 to December of 2021, so start of the pandemic to the end of last year, M2, the money in circulation and as well as deposits in banks, grew at an 18% annual rate. Annually, not over the whole pandemic. The whole pandemic was right around 40% growth in the money. That's the printing money scenario. And at the same time, inflation climbed to 9%. You don't have a growth in money like that without having inflation. And I said this before, I don't think any of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, are shocked by what we're seeing. I mean, we, we shut the world down for, for two years and then printed money on top of it. So we have a money supply growth issue along with the general rise of goods and services. That's inflation 101, right? And when we don't have wages, which I've talked about a lot too, when you don't have wages keeping pace with the price increase of goods and services, you're gonna have a disparity of inflation. We're seeing it at the grocery store with milk, we're seeing it at the gas station when we try to fill up our car with gas. And the 2020 shutdowns and all the international conflicts that we've seen starting this year, we've shown that really anything's possible. But current signs, back to the conversation about recession and inflation, current signs right now as it stands, aren't indicating a recession. Now, will it come? 
Maybe, no one has a crystal ball here. And I do think that you can see, I think a lot of people just in their own emotions are feeling like, well, wait, Brad, we're kind of already in a recession. I mean, are you seeing it? There's a lot of indicators when it comes to a recession. And it's important to note here, when you look at all these factors of inflation and supply chain, that GDP, gross domestic production growth, is not the only measure of a recession. The signs of a recession include other things like employment consumption, industrial production, just to name a few. So inflation, in our opinion, should be peaking here real soon. And recently, we had a not so expected increase in those inflation numbers. As you saw, 9.1 versus the eight expected, you saw markets react. Even with that, we are anticipating inflation peaking soon. However, we do see it taking probably the rest of this year of 2022 and really into some of 2023 to get back down to a target rate of around 2% that the Fed likes to see. The increase in the supply of workers is also something we've been talking about because it's actually easing wage growth. By the way, a quick recap, the average hourly earnings fell to a still inflationary 5.2, but it dropped down from 5.5%. It's going down. And I wanna tie in something here on the discussion of inflation in the market and volatility in the last 40 years. And I'm specifically gonna use 40 years, 1982. And I chose 40 years for this reason. Many listening right now or watching have likely been around the market or been invested, have some exposure to the equity markets or bond markets or just investing in general within that 40 years. And two, the second reason is when you talk about inflation, we've been talking about it, many of you watching right now, we really haven't seen inflation in 40 years. So we saw it previously in the 60s and 70s, as many of us remember, and into some of the 80s. But in the last 40 years, and I mentioned this on last week's show around different notes and stats when I was building something, I want to reiterate it here again. In the past 40 years, we've had six recessions, five bear markets, 41 federal rate hikes. We've had a dot-com bubble. We've had a great financial crisis in 2008. We've had two 50% plus stock market crashes. We've been involved in 12 US involved wars. We've had a global pandemic. We've had political impeachment inquiries. We've seen a lot in 40 years, but you know what we haven't seen on that list? They'll notice the one thing that wasn't on there was inflation. So I understand something about inflation is that inflation is real. It's going down. We're seeing it peaking, our opinion. It's not gonna be as high as we've been seeing it, but just right now, we're getting a lot of numbers coming off this pandemic. And as everything's opening back up, we just don't have the supply. We know that in general terms, the supply is just not there, but we are seeing it come back. And as we open up areas of the world to increase our supply, we should see those numbers ebb. And it's important to note that how you stick to your plan and your discipline will be how you are rewarded. Understanding discipline. Discipline's easy when you're motivated. Discipline's easy when you have a goal in sight and it's like relatively in near term. Discipline's hard when you're getting mud slung at you every day in the markets right now. I get it. But it's really important to talk about that when you talk about the psychology of money and rewarding yourself for staying true to a discipline when it comes to investments. We do it when we work out. We do it when we try to eat healthier. We do it when we try to attain certain goals in our life to benefit our life. We set these goal markers and we want to be rewarded for those. The same thing comes with your money because it matters when you talk about inflation because inflation is a tricky one. And I say it this way for this reason. It's tricky because it's not tangible. You can't touch, feel, and taste it. It's not this pen, right? I can see it. I know it's a pen. I can use it. Inflation is kind of this like oxygen. We know it's there. We breathe it, but we don't really see it. The only way we see it is when it's right in front of our face. It's being talked about on the news or we're going to the gas station. We're now paying four, five, six dollars, depending on where you live, at the pump. It's real. We just don't see it like that. So we need to understand that your money has to keep pace with it. So here's some items to look at when you talk about inflation and how to understand your investments and how you're saving. And Brad, should I even be involved in the markets right now or should I just wait? I mean, we've talked about that on other episodes and other shows, but if you're in cash right now or just talking about cash or fearful of the market, you have to understand cash. You're not gonna get a negative number on your statement as a negative return in cash, we know that. But your purchasing power, which is basically the reflection of inflation, your purchasing power will go down. The amount of that dollar and what it's worth next year or three years from now or five years from now, or maybe even 10 years from now is incrementally decreasing as inflation rears its ugly head. So we want to bring this back up again. We want to be talking about it. And when we talk about managing your wealth and we talk about managing 
your investments for clients, keeping items like with fixed income and bonds, your duration short, because if we have an interest rate increase environment, which is what we're in right now, and understanding inflation, being out there too long on the scale can hurt us with interest rate risk. And we need to make sure we're finding on the equity side, the right sectors, the right industries that will keep pace with inflation and rebalancing and managing them on an active basis. We do that for our clients here at One Capital, and we want to make sure everyone listening and, and watching today understands to do that for themselves or with their advisor. And if we talk about baby formula today, back to that issue, it's a much broader issue as you can see. It relates to our supply issues, it relates to our inflation discussions we've been having, and many of these questions that have been kicked up, we wanna answer those questions about the fears and anxieties that you have right now, which by the way, let's just be open and honest with each other. Everyone has it, we're all human. We wanna make sure that we seek advice, seek counsel, make sure we're not letting our emotions drive the ship because logic and rationale are the ones that will get rewarded when it comes to disciplined investing. Okay, it's time to answer your questions. If you have a question or a topic you'd like me to address, you can leave a comment or a question in the comment section, or if it's something you wanna talk about more one-on-one, -on -one, just go to the about page on this channel and send us an email. We'll always keep the questions I read here anonymous, so you never have to worry about your name being shared, but we'd love to hear from you. We love the interaction from our, from our followers, uh, from our subscribers, so again, go to our about page and you can uh, send us an email and go through it. And the question came in this week around supply chain and its link and its relationship specifically to inflation, so I thought it was a very topical question. Brad, you talk about supply chain and I hear it a lot lately. What does supply chain and inflation really have to do with each other? Well said. I think a lot of times I bring this and I like this question because I think with the way communication comes to us nowadays, we, we all get it so fast. And when we hear supply chain, and we hear it a couple more times that day even, we start saying it. But I think sometimes we don't truly understand what it means. The supply chain in our economy and globally really is the flow of distribution from the production to the actual end user. Makes sense, right? That, that shouldn't be past anybody really. The conversation then comes when things stop up, right? When we have an issue when it comes to there's a stoppage and take right now as an example. In China, because of a no COVID policy still, they're a large manufacturer. So when ports are closed there, it stops the the, the chain of reaction of everything. So we start getting these kinks in the chain, right? And that ultimately leads to supply chain issues, which really is supply chain shortages. When you have a shortage of something and you have a lot of money, as we talked about earlier, chasing after it, you literally get the definition of inflation. Too much money chasing too few of goods. So the linkage to this question is supply chain impacts inflation in that regard. If we slow or we have an issue with our supply and we have money still around and the demand is still high, inflation is the result. Again, if you have a question or a comment you'd like me to read here on the show, you can leave it in the comment section or again, email us in the about page on our channel. But before we go this week, if you found anything helpful today and you wanna learn more, you can visit us on our website at onecapital.com. You can also call or text us, we wanna help. Listen, there's no pressure here. We don't treat people like a number, in fact, we value our relationships. It's the lifeblood of what we do. So click, call, or text us today. By the way, if you're not following us on social media, you should be. You can follow us at Make Your Money Matter. We're sharing great information on all of our social media platforms. And as I often say, if you enjoy the show, share with someone you like. And I guess if you don't like the show, share with someone you don't like. But until next time, always remember, make your money matter. The information in this show is educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration a listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.